Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, where we're still going through the Sermon on the Mount. We have been going through this sermon for a while, and it will take more time. So, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. Some of you might have this question, why this pastor has decided to skip verses uh, 31 and 32. I'm not skipping them. I'm skipping them for now, but we'll be back to those verses because it takes more uh, diligent search and research, including the epistles of Peter and Paul to preach on that subject of divorces and remarriages. Today, our text is from chapter 5 verses 33 to 37. Let me just pray and please support you in your hearts and your minds me as I pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come to your house and pray and worship and teach your holy word. Lord, we're just praying for your supernatural spirit to fill our hearts. We're, working, we're praying for the work of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds as we're studying this important passage. Lord, just be with me. Guide my heart, my lips, my mouth to say what you need to tell your people. And Lord, we're just devoting this time into your providential care, your wisdom and discernment. Let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight. That's what we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of the message is uh, on the slide. A word is a pledge, the end of oaths. A word is a pledge, the end of oaths. Most of our church members, they're born Canadian citizens, right? But we also have some church members who have become Canadian citizens. And in order to become a citizen of any country, you need to give what? An oath of pledge, yeah, or the allegiance to the queen, to the queen. That's what we had to do as a family as well. Also, in the English language, I cannot speak for other languages. I heard it many times, even in the Christian circles, even among Christians at different churches, people often say, fingers crossed. Have you heard it? And they say, fingers crossed, next Sunday we're planning to do this. And I was kind of uh, baffled a little bit by this expression, by this phrase, fingers crossed. What does it mean? Which book of the Bible is it borrowed or taken from? Fingers crossed. And we have, in any human language, many expressions like that. Like different expressions. But anyways, as an introduction... Let me just start with this question. How long or since when have people been lying in this world? Can anybody give us an answer? When did people start lying to one another? In the, yeah, somebody, in the beginning. Since the first original sin committed by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You're right. The lies or credibility gaps have existed since the fall in the Garden of Eden and have continually been one of the major marks of this world around us. Satan is the prince of this world and since he is not only a liar himself but also the father of all lies. So Satan the devil is called the father of all lies. It's not surprising, should not be surprising for us, dear friends, that the system the evil one has is characterized by lying. By lying. There's lots of lying around us in this world. And so Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 8 verse 44 says, when he was uh, talking to his enemies, opponents, scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. In John 8, 44, he says, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 
very, very serious accusation. And Jesus was so straightforward, he threw those words at the faces of his enemies, those scribes and Pharisees. He told them that they were children of the devil. They were liars. They belonged to the father of all lies. Because all men are born in sin, the Bible, this book, teaches that, all men are born liars. I'm not asking you this question, uh, whether you've ever told a lie in your life. I'm sure we, we've lied many times. We, we did that many times. Because in the Bible, both in the Old and the New Testament, we can find the evidence. Psalm 58, 3 says, Psalm 58, 3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. These who speak lies go astray from birth. Those of you who are parents, you have children. Did your children ever lie to you? Honestly, raise your hands. How about you? When you were a child, did you ever lie to your mom and dad? Raise your hands. I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed of myself, but we did it many times to cover up, to excuse ourselves. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 3 through 5, we read the following words. Jeremiah 9, 3 to 5. They bend their tongue like the bow, lies, and not truth prevail in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me declares the Lord. Everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity. That was a description from God through prophet Jeremiah about the spiritual life in Israel in those days. Lies, lies, lies. Neighbors were lying to their neighbors. According to the polls reported by USA Today, there's a newspaper in, the, in, uh, our, uh, in our southern neighbor, Americans, I, don't, I could not find statistics about Canadians yet. I hope we're way different from Americans. I hope so, in that sense. So according to the polls reported by USA Today, Americans lie and are lied to much more than they even realize. Cite and statistics from the book, The Day America Told the Truth. The newspaper reported that 91% of Americans lie routinely. So 9 out of 10 people, they just keep doing this. They lie many times during one day, and they think it's just fine. For instance, 36% of those interviewed tell dark and important lies. 86% lie regularly to parents. Can you imagine? After the service, when you come back home, look at the faces of your sweet kids. Wow. 86% lie regularly to parents, to us. 75% lie to their friends. 73% lie to their siblings, brothers and sisters in the same household. 69% lie to their spouses. Unbelievable. And we, most of us would, th would say, well, it's not me. I never lied to my wife. I mean, I'm that good. That's why she still likes me and loves me, and that's why we're still married. 43% lie about their income. That's horrible. Half of the United States, almost, they cheat on their taxes. And we might think, well, it's, it's the United States. I just, ah. But Canada is much better. The magazine Discipleship Journal asked its readers to rank the areas of greatest spiritual challenge to them. The results came in this order. As it was horrible, funny and tragically. On the first place, materialism. Second, pride. Third, self-centeredness. Fourth, laziness. Fifth, anger, bitterness, and sexual lust. Sixth, envy. Seventh, gluttony. And the last place on this, uh, on this list, lying. 
So folks are much less concerned about lying than all other, thing, uh, all other things. And so lying has become a common thing in our life, to lie to any other human being around us. Even the most corrupt societies, however, just listen to this statement, even the most corrupt societies have always realized that, in certain areas at least, the real truth is necessary. Courts of law require witnesses to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing by the truth. For some reason, in courts, they want to hear the true story. The ancient Jewish rabbis moralistically considered lying, along with scoffing, hypocrisy, and slander, to be one of the four great sins that would shut a person out of God's presence. So they considered it, at least in, on paper, that it was a very serious transgression before holy God, lying. The human problem is not being truthful. The Jews of Jesus' day valued the idea of truth and principle, but in practice it was buried under their system of traditions, which over centuries had continually cut God's law down to fit their own sinful perspectives and purposes. In our passage this morning, the Lord Jesus exposes Jewish distortion and contradiction of the divine revelation they claimed to love and teach. In these five verses, Jesus sets forth the original Mosaic teaching, the traditional perversion of that teaching, and his own emphasis of what God's standards for truth have always been. Point number one, the principle of God's law, Mosaic law, verse 33. Let me just read it uh, here. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. The traditional uh, rabbi's teaching was that, uh, Jesus quotes here, was a bunch of ideas based on Leviticus 19.12, Numbers 32, Deuteronomy 23.21. These Old Testament texts contain several prohibitions against uh, swearing falsely by the name of the Lord. For instance, Leviticus 19.12 says, You shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. To swear by God's name meant that he was your witness, that you were telling the truth. That's how people accept it and uh, consider it. A clear description of an oath is given in Hebrews 6.16. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. God allowed to swear by his name in the Old Testament times, and many Old Testament saints, both before and after the giving of the law, followed the practice. Abraham confirmed his promises to the king of Sodom in Genesis 14 and to king Abimelech in Genesis 21. In Genesis 21 verses 23 and 24 we read, Now therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my posterity, but according to the kindness that I have shown to you, you shall show to me and to the land in which you have sojourned. Abraham said, I swear it. So, those oaths were done in the name of the Lord. Even God himself that's an interesting fact that's in the scripture, made oaths on certain occasions. Genesis 22, 16, 17 says, and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. 
and your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies. Jesus Christ many times used in the New Testament, in the Gospel, this phrase, truly I say to you. And even more emphatic, the Lord said a few times, truly, truly, I say to you, like John 1, 51, John 3, 3, John 5, 19, and John 5, 24, to call attention to a teaching of specific importance. So once you're home today, after your lunch, you can start practicing your family. Truly, truly, I'm saying to you, my dear wife, or my dear husband, or my son, or my daughter, an oath no matter how strong the words used is only as reliable as the one who makes it. Now think about it. It's only as reliable as the one who makes it. In Matthew 26, verses 69 through 74, we read about Peter, Apostle Peter swearing. The Apostle Peter used God's name in vain. No wonder that he went out and wept bitterly. In Matthew 26, 75, we read, And Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. But I, remember, I hope you remember, dear friends, how Peter had behaved or misbehaved before his denial. He said to the Lord Jesus, Lord, if anybody else or everybody else would just flee away, just forsaken you, I'm the guy, I'm that apostle who would just lay down your life for you. And he horribly fell. He denied the Lord Jesus three times. By Old Testament law, oaths were to be made only in God's name. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, Isaiah 65, 16. God established the seriousness of keeping an oath in Leviticus chapter 5 and Joshua chapter 9. So point number two of this message sounds like this. The perversion of Jewish rabbinic tradition. Again, verse 33. Let me read it one more time. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not make false vows but shall fulfill your vows to their Lord. Virtually any kind of oath used for almost any kind of purpose was acceptable, just as long as it was not false and the person would keep it, would fulfill it. And the Jews in Jesus' day sought to avoid the impropriety of swearing falsely by God's name by substituting it heaven, earth, Jerusalem, or their heads, that by which they uh, did swearing. That kind of routine oath-making was usually lie-making, and it was considered by those who practiced it to be perfectly acceptable, as long as it was not in the name of the Lord. They substituted. They excused themselves. They were so tricky, they were smart enough to use other words, like, I'm swearing by Jerusalem. I'm swearing by my own head. The command from Leviticus 19.12, you shall not swear falsely by my name, was conveniently interpreted to mean that swearing falsely by any other name was allowed. No wonder that through rabbinic tradition, God's standard of absolute truthfulness was contradicted and lowered to a level that accommodated the sinful, selfish capacities and purposes of the people. People wanted to lie, and they did not want to be judged by God's absolute standard of truth. So point number three, the perspective of divine, divine truth, verses 34 through 37. But I say to you, but I say to you, how many times did Jesus have to say those words in his, in his Sermon on the Mount? But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. 
but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond there is of evil. Jesus condemns such distortion of the law as mere hypocrisy and forbids any form of swearing or oaths in ordinary conversations, in day-by-day -day conversations. <clears throat> Because to swear by heaven is to swear by God's throne. To swear by the earth is to, to swear by his footstool. To swear by Jerusalem is to swear by the royal capital. Even to swear by one's own head involves God, because God is a creator of all. Jesus' point was, that God is the creator and Lord of everything and is the God of truth in everything. What does it mean for us followers of Jesus, say, living in 2022? Well, it means that our life cannot be divided into compartments in, we, in some of which God is involved and in others are which he's not involved. That's sometimes, or maybe often, that's how we behave, that's how we live our lives. There cannot be one kind of language in the church on Sunday morning. I'm going to the church on Sunday morning. I must behave, I should look holy and speak holy, and things like that. And another kind of contact, say, at work or on a soccer field or basketball court. Truth has no degrees or shades. And you know, if you go, summer is coming, Lord willing, sooner or later, if you go and just watch uh, kids or adults playing basketball and soccer in summer months, you will recognize many faces, uh, uh, people who come to church a Sunday after Sunday. But as you watch those kids and adults playing, oh boy, oh brother, you will hear different English language you probably would not like to hear on a daily basis. So even people who can be church members, whenever they do something outside, they swear. A half-truth is a whole lie. Remember what Abraham told about his wife to Pharaoh's officials. She's my sister. Yeah. And a white lie, you even can see and read such an expression, hear it, white lie is really black one. God has never had any standard lower than absolute truthfulness. Prophet Jeremiah, again, we have heard his uh, quote already, wept over Israel in Jeremiah 9.3 because lies and not truth prevail in the land. Lies and not truth prevent in the land. Whenever you pray for our community, for our province, for our country, please pray for the truth to prevail in Canada, not for the lies. The destiny of liars is the lake of Clear Lake, right in Mountain National Park. No. The destiny of liars is the lake of fire. Revelation 21 8 says, Revelation 21, 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's in the Bible. Revelation 21, 8. So whenever next time, in your heart, in your mind, you want to tell a lie, please, don't do it. If you've done it already, confess it. Repent of it before the Lord. Application. Number one, or conclusion of this text or message. God's absolute, unchanging standard is truth and sincerity in everything. That's God's standard for us. If you say that I'm a Christian, or I'm a good Christian, then be a person, be a man or woman of truth. Stop lying. Two, for the Christian, an oath is unnecessary. His yes should mean yes, and his no should mean no. No fingers crossed. 
If it's yes, let it be yes. If it's no, let it be no. There are no circumstances under which it is proper for Christians to lie. Three, God is a holy God. In fact, how many times we read in the scripture when angels or God's people, whenever they worship the Lord, you just hear that exclamation, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God is a holy God. His kingdom is a holy kingdom. And the people of his kingdom are to be holy people. His righteousness is to be their righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37, Jesus Christ shatters the glass of hypocritical oaths, which people used to cover their lies. Four, this text, Matthew 5, 33 through 37, does not forbid taking an oath in a court of law. We should apply this text right and accurately. This text does not forbid taking an oath in a court of law. Jesus himself testified under oath before the high priest in Matthew 26, 63. The apostle Paul also used an oath to call God as his witness that what he was writing was true. For example, 2 Corinthians 1.23, 2 Corinthians 1.23 says, But I call God as witness to my soul that to spare you I did not come again to Corinth. And Galatians 1.20 says, Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. So there's a proper place to give an oath but in our everyday living, day-by-day -day conversations, God teaches us clearly, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount, to stop lying, tell the true story, tell the truth to other people. And so, there's a prayer, I found it somewhere, I don't remember even when and how, but it's a long, 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 uh, it's a, this prayer was said many, many years ago. Lord, please put a guard over my mouth that I may never take you for granted or speak of you in a foolish way. Touch my lips and make me clean. In Jesus' name, amen. Touch my lips and make me clean. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we're having one more uh, song by our worship team and then benediction. and worship with beautiful, great Christian songs. For benediction, just uh, would like to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss, all the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And don't just run away. Just one quick more announcement. Uh, we're going to have a cake uh, in, the, in that part of our sanctuary because there's a celebration. We welcomed officially three new church members into our church family. So if you're not afraid of gaining some weight, if you're not afraid of tasting good cake and some tea and coffee, please stay for this kind of fellowship. God bless you all and come back next Sunday. Lord willing, not fingers crossed, but Lord willing, we'll see each other again. God bless you all.